Hey now, brawlers, it's time for another Board Game Brawl review with Nick Meenahan, sponsored by BoardGameBliss.com. Hey now, today we're going to take another look at Fury of Dracula, and that is because this is the new third edition of the game from Fantasy Flight Games. I recently reviewed the second edition, finally, uh, that had been out back in, I think, 2008 that one originally came out, maybe even earlier than that, uh, but had been out of print for quite some time. So this is good news that this game is coming out. If you watched my previous review of the game, you know it's a game I really, really love. Fantastic game, and the fact that it is now widely available again for people is fantastic news. Now you might say, what is different about this version of the game? And by the way, if you're not familiar with this game, if you are completely new to Fury of Dracula and that's where you're coming in with this review, which is fine, I'm going to do a total overview of the game. Um, this is all about, is it a one versus all game where one player is Dracula running around the Eastern European countryside trying to evade the hunters from Bram Stoker's famous novel. The hunters are trying to kill Dracula, Dracula is trying to gain influence and power over the continent in order to raise his vampire kingdom. Uh, take some liberties with the book. But that's essentially what's going on and uh, there's a lot of uh, trickery and deduction. It's like letters from White Chapel or Scotland Yard and so on. But for those of you who are familiar with the old versions of the game, or let's not even take put the first edition in the um, equation because I, I know nothing about that and what the differences are. Just the second edition. For those who had played that edition, what's different? Well, not a ton. The core gameplay of the second edition is there. You'll look by looking at the board, even though the game was given an art overhaul, which I would say would be a lateral move. It's good, but it's not that drastically better than the original second edition. Um, but you look at the board, looks mostly the same, the layout's the same, the characters, the core gameplay elements are all the same. However, there are some noticeable tweaks, changes, and adjustments to several of the game systems. Not that I think would be enough to make you completely change your mind on the game, one way or the other, but if you already are inclined to like the game, it might make your gameplay experience a little bit smoother. So I probably didn't catch every single subtle change they made to the game, if indeed there are a lot of subtle changes I don't know about. But I did catch some of them, and I will rattle those off after we give an overview of the game. We'll come back, I'll let you know what I think. All right, I'm going to give you a hopefully brief overview of the third edition of Fury of Dracula. This is a competitive game for two to five players. One player is Dracula, and one or more players are going to represent the hunters. There must always be four of the hunter characters in play. If you have less than four hunter players, then one or more players is going to have to double up on the hunters that they have control of. Uh, now, each player is going to get a character sheet with a, which they will put in front of them, and that includes Dracula. So Dracula will have his sheet. All of these are random tokens that are going to be used for various um, different special abilities and effects. Uh, I have very limited table space, so a lot of this stuff is going to be crowded together, uh, at least when I have the table set up in this direction. Uh, Dracula is also going to have a bevy of different cards that he's going to use. Not the laptop. He doesn't get to use a laptop in the game, fortunately. It's out of the wrong time period. Uh, he'll have a whole stack of location cards. He'll have encounter cards, which are the ones with the hand on the back. Combat cards. And then the optional power cards, which are the advanced rules. Though I do recommend playing with them. There's no reason not to. We'll get into all that a little bit later. Uh, then all of the hunter characters are going to be seated in a very specific order clockwise from Dracula. So you always have Lord Godalming first, then you have Dr. Uh, John Seward, then uh, this is actually one of Dracula's things too, this is a cheat sheet of the uh, continent. Uh, then you have Van Helsing and Mina Harker. So yeah, they have the numbers in the top corner, so they must always be seated in that uh, direction. Uh, and just as long as we're there, actually, we'll talk about their character sheets. Each character sheet, including Dracula's, is going to have a list of different special abilities. Uh, and so, for instance, Van Helsing's is Leader, which says that when you trade, you may choose to trade event cards instead of item cards with a hunter in any city. And he's strong-willed, which means that he has two bite spaces. Normally, if a hunter would take a second bite, then he would be defeated, but Van Helsing can take three bites before he's defeated, so he has two sp uh, bites there. There's a turn sequence sheet sheet. There are reminders on the top and bottom of the cards as to how many item cards and event cards you can hold at any given time. Normally, that is three for each. And then you have your hit point tracker here, which will uh, tell you 
uh, how much damage you can take before you are defeated. If you are defeated, if you are a hunter and you are defeated in this game, you get sent to one of the hospitals out on the map and uh, lose all of your stuff. Essentially, that's what happens. Now, those types of abilities are in stark contrast to Dracula himself's abilities, uh, which are quite different. So, for instance, uh, you notice that he has 15 hit points. That is the goal of the hunters. The hunter's only goal is to kill Dracula. That's it. That's the only way that cooperatively the hunters can win the game. Uh, Dracula wants to get his influence track up. Up in the top corner of the board here, he has this influence track that goes from 0 to 13. It starts off on 0, obviously. If he can ever make that track reach 13, he immediately wins the game. His power has grown too much and the hunters can no longer stop him at that point. The ways that he's going to move that track up, there's a few different ways. First, he may mature vampire cards. As he progresses through the game, he may drop newly born vampires out, quote unquote, born vampires out on the map. And if he does that, then uh, he moves up either three, four, or five spaces, depending on the type of vampire. Uh, there's a combat card called Fangs, which enables him to give bites. If he can do that, then he can advance one on the track. And finally, if he defeats any of the hunters, he gets to move up the track too. Plus one for every one of his despair tokens that are on the board. The despair tokens are a new feature of the game. They will cover up the sundial here slowly during the course of the game every time that you cycle around the track once. I'll get to all that. So back to Dracula. I know I'm kind of jumping all over the place here. There's a lot to cover. Uh, Dracula has different special abilities like Rage. After a hunter is defeated, you advance the influence track, uh, which I kind of already explained. Uh, plus the number of the spirit tokens on the board. Then he has Pride. If Dracula plays either the Escape as Mist or Escape as Bat, before he has played a number of combat cards greater than the number of the spirit tokens on the track, the card is canceled, meaning he cannot run unless the situation is dire enough to force him to do so. And then, of course, the Fury of Dracula ability, which is also based on the Despair tokens. That says that after you place a city location card or a hide on the trail, while all three Despair tokens are on the time track, you advance the influence track by three, which is another way for the influence track to go up, uh, just showing that the longer you wait, the worse things are going to get if you're a hunter. All right, so back to the setup. Uh, this is the map of Europe. There's a lot of different things going on here. The, the board is full of small cities that look like that, and then large cities that look like that. And they are all connected. There's also areas that have hospitals, and there is Castle Dracula. Uh, there's also, some of the cities are ports connected to sea zones, and the sea zones might uh, have dotted lines separating the two of them. Uh, connecting all the different cities are either roads, which are the red lines, the yellow lines are yellow railroads, and then over on the eastern section of Europe you're going to have uh, the white railroads, and sometimes you have multiple uh, of these different routes connected to the same city. At the start of the game, every hero, hunter, starts off in a very specific place, So, and you'll put their miniatures out onto the board. So, for instance, Seward starts off in Marseille whereas uh, Mina starts off in Brussels, and uh, Van Helsing is in Amsterdam. Godalming is all the way over here in Constanta. Uh, Dracula, however, stays off the board until he is found out, because this is a game of cat and mouse, and Dracula is hiding and gallivanting all over Europe. So the hunters don't know where he is at the beginning. What Dracula is going to do, he's the main impetus for almost all of his stuff during the course of the game is this deck of location cards. Every single city out on the board is represented by a card that he keeps in order in his deck, as well as the C cards, which have different colored backs. He is When it is Dracula's turn, and I'll get to all that, he is going to secretly choose one of those cards, first off at the start of the game, and that after he sees where all the heroes are, and that represents where he is. The set of cards, and there may be more than one card coming out into a spot, I'll explain all that, is called a hideout. So every one of these spots could potentially be a hideout as he places cards into them. So they'll start off in a randomized location. Then uh, the game begins and you go back to the hunters. You're going to look at the dial in the top corner of the board. This represents the different phases of the game. You always start off on Monday during the day. Uh, during the day phase, the hunters get to take their day actions. First off, if combat would happen to break out during the day, that would happen first uh, during the phases. But then it goes into the day actions. Once they get done, the hunters get done with their day actions, then it goes to dusk where combat might happen again, but then it goes to night actions. Then Dracula has his phase 
and then it will go to Tuesday day and so on and so forth. You're going to keep going around. And again, every time you go around, you're going to add a new despair token to the map, which is not a good thing for the hunters. Now, during the day and night phase, there are several different actions that the hunters can take. The only thing, in fact, that uh, you'll get one action during the day and the night. The only thing that the hunters cannot do in both phases is um, the movement action. You can only move during the day. And in fact, we'll go ahead and start off explaining that one. If a hunter wants to move, they have several different options. First is they can go out to sea. If they want to go out to sea, very simply, they have to be in a port uh, city, and then they can just choose to go out to sea. And then they're kind of stuck there. They can't do anything during the night phase, but then on their next day turn, they can move back into a city that is connected by port. Uh, instead, they can choose to travel by road. Moving by road is very simply uh, moving via one of the red lines to a connected city, which and you can only move one for one action. So Constanta here is connected to both Bucharest and Varna via road, so you can go to either one of those Lord Godalmin can. You could alternatively choose to go by train, but in order to go by train, you have to have a ticket. And this is another new aspect of the game. This used to be resolved via dice. Each of these train tickets, and if you've played Eldritch Horror, you might be a little bit familiar with these, has uh, different numbers on them, either yellow and or white. Sometimes it's only got a one yellow or one white number. You, when you reserve a ticket, you'll, these will be randomized. You'll take one off the top of the stack and put it in front of you. You can only have two of them at a time. And when you try to uh, take an action to travel by train, you use one of your tickets, and however far uh, it allows you to travel, you get to go that distance. And so you may not want to use yellow here because that only lets you get one space that's connected by road anyways. But let's say you had a two yellow. The white's not going to do anything for you, but you choose to go two yellow. You could travel boom, boom, follow the railways, and go that many spaces. If I was over on the eastern side of the map, I could use the white number to go that many white train tracks. So moving is an action, but also reserving a ticket is an action, but uh, moving can only be done during the day. Reserving a ticket can be done during day or night. Next you can do is rest. Resting is just recovering a damage. If you've taken a damage from a previous turn uh, on your character sheet, you can just rest and remove uh, one of the blood tokens. You can trade if more than one hunter is in the exact same city, unless you're Van Helsing who can do it anywhere. You can choose to trade items. Now, you can do any kind of table talk you want during this game, although Dracula can hear everything you say. But you can't abjectly show people your cards, kind of like the old pandemic rule. Uh, but if you're in the same city together, you can compare hands secretly without saying anything out loud and then choose to trade items back and forth. Van Helsing can do it from anywhere and can also do event cards. Um, another one of the actions you can do is searching. Now, searching is something that's not going to make total sense right now, but Dracula is going to have the opportunity to put encounter cards down on his trail as he travels. Sometimes he uses those to ambush, but sometimes they just sit there and he can't ambush with them or he doesn't want to. If you're in a city that has one of those cards on it and Dracula chooses to do nothing with it, you can choose to search in order to encounter that card, to force an encounter with that card and deal with it in whatever uh, way you have to. Uh... The next type of action you can take is supply. So let's say that you are in a major city, either one of the cities, uh, just any one of the cities except for Castle Dracula that is uh, large on the map. You can choose to take the supply action and take an item card from the item deck. Uh, and actually Lord Godalming can choose to take two of them. But after you get done drawing your item, you must draw an event card. Event cards can be good or bad because they either have a gray symbol on it symbolizing that it's for a hunter, or let's see if there's one immediately available. Or it has that uh, bat symbol which uh, and skull symbol, which is for Dracula. Now the good news is, if you take the supply action to take an item during the day, you get to take a, a card off the top of the deck. And if it's one of your cards with your hunter symbol on it, you just take it and you can keep it in your hand and do whatever it says. It may say play immediately. It may say hold on to it and use it later. Whatever it might be. If there happens to be one of Dracula's cards on the top of the deck during the day phase, then you'll take your supply and then you'll just simply discard that uh, Dracula card into the discard pile. The bad news for this, though, is that if you want to resupply during the night phase, you still draw an item card as normal, but you are forced to take the event card from the bottom of the deck. And if it's your card, great. If it's one of Dracula's, you... There you go. 
you have to hand it to Dracula and he gets to use it against you and it's always bad. So let me show you some of the item cards and then I'll also show you other games I have to review. And I'll also show you some uh, of the event cards as well after this. So there's cards like Holy Circle. Now anytime you see a banner here, that means it can be used in combat. The Holy Circle says choose one or more hunters to be removed from this combat and then discard this card. The Stake. You reveal this card before you search and if you reveal a vampire card or a hoax, you discard both this card and that card. That's a good way to deal with vampires if you think you're about to face one. The Fast Horses. You can reveal this card during the day. Reveal a ticket token from your t uh, token uh, pool to move a number of roads up to the yellow number on that token. Uh, rifle, another combat card. The vampire suffers two damage. These symbols are very important. I'll explain more when we get to combat. The knife, the, uh, the uh, vampire suffers three damage. Dogs, if you have dogs, you can't be affected by rats, saboteurs, spies, or wolves. Uh, the garlic wreath, uh, you will reveal this card before cards are chosen during the first round of combat until the end of combat when you suffer damage from fangs. The vampire suffers four damage. And a crucifix, another combat card. Uh, if this canceled fangs or mesmerized, the vampire takes three damage. Now, for the event cards, uh, for the good guy ones, you have Speedy Telegraph. You play this at dawn, and then it enables you and the other players to take their actions in any order, not the set seating order. Blood Transfusion, you can play it as an action if you are not weakened. A weakened uh, hunter in your city removes a bite token, and you suffer a damage. You transfuse your blood into him. Heroic Leap. Uh, instead of resolving combat, when you would go into combat, the vampire suffers 5 damage and you suffer 5 damage. Uh, this is an example of an ally card. Both uh, Dracula and the, all of the hunters together can have one ally in play. Uh, or you can choose to use them as an ability, in which case just a one-shot card. You choose a city, Dracula must reveal that city's location card. As an ally, however, he stays in play and whenever a hideout shifts to the sixth space on the trail, you reveal that card. Dracula has his own nasty events like Unearthly Swiftness. Play it during the Dracula phase. After this phase, he gets another phase. Summon Storms. You put up to three Storm Tokens on the board. Uh, hunters cannot move into a C-Zone that has a Storm Token, and you'll slowly start removing those. Roadblock is the same type of card. You put out roadblocks, blocking off different uh, areas of the uh, different uh, roads or railways on the board, and you'll slowly be removed after that. And then an example of one of Dracula's allies, Dracula's Brides. He can either choose to, to use it as Corrupt, which is choose up to two hideouts from among the first, second, or third spaces on the trail and place an encounter card on each, or use him as an ally, in which case at the start of each of his phases he may discard an encounter card to draw another. Now after the hunters get done with their phase, then it is uh, both day and night, then it is time for Dracula. Remember he starts off in a location of his choosing hidden from the other hunters. And uh, by the way, from this point forward, if the hunters happen to move into a space that actually has Dracula or Dracula moves into a space that uh, has one of the hunters, Dracula is immediately revealed out onto the board and the applicable location card on the trail gets revealed. Uh, so what this means is that uh, when the first thing Dracula does is move. He's going to take another one of his location cards that has to be adjacent to wherever he currently is. He'll slide this one to the right of the track and put out the new location card. And then he immediately plops down one of his encounter cards onto that card. The encounter cards are nasty things that are going to either uh, increase the Count's influence or and or trip up the vampire hunters as they come across them. But every round, he's going to be moving and putting more cards out onto the track, uh, continuing to move around Europe. Whenever one of the hunters moves into a card that was that is on the trail, whether or not Dracula is actually there or not, that card gets flipped over, and the other players get to see if they're on the trail or not, and it stays on the trail going like so. Uh, now, it is possible that Dracula will want to travel by sea. If he chooses to travel by sea, there are special cards for that that have their own different back, which means that the heroes will know when Dracula goes out to sea. And in fact, when Dracula goes out to sea, it's dangerous for him because he'll immediately take, um, I think it's three damage, I'm sorry, I'm blanking right this second, He'll take uh, two or three damage, and then he can stay out at sea if he wants, and he must move all the time, which means he can move to a new sea zone if he wants, but if he does, 
He takes an additional damage every time he moves to another sea zone while still out at sea, but he can choose to disembark and get back to land uh, whenever he wants to. But again, then the hunters are going to know that because a new type of card will come out onto the trail. If at any point uh, Dracula has moved enough that a card would fall off of the trail, a couple things might happen. First off, Dracula immediately gets that location card back. This means, and since there's only one of each card, that means he can never backtrack until he gets the location card back and it falls off the trail. But also, some of the encounter cards may have a special ability when they mature. To mature, an encounter card has to fall off of the track with its location card, uh, signifying the trail growing cold. And FYI, the reason why there is a tiny map is so that Dracula doesn't have to give any clues to the hunters as to where he might be by actually like crouching or, or leaning over the board and looking at it. Instead, he can just refer to this map in secret and not tip his hands to the hunters. But okay, let me show you some of his encounter cards so you have an idea of what I'm talking about with those. First, you have the different, uh, if I can never focus, the different types of vampire cards, which could be combat encounters for the heroes, potentially. Um, if, uh, so what will happen is either with one of these encounter cards, if the hero, one of the hunters, moves into a space that, uh, city that has an encounter card, Dracula can choose to ambush them with it if it applies. If not, the hunter has to search for it to make it go off. So a new vampire, uh, the hunter will fight this vampire. Other hunters on this location may become delayed to participate in this combat. If it matures, in this particular case, he moves his influence track up by three, and then you clear out the hideout spots on the fourth, fifth, and sixth spaces of the board. The Reckless Vampire only has four hit points, and every time you resolve fangs during an ambush, advance the influence track by one. He's just recklessly eating people. Um, and he matures the track by four if he, um, if he falls off. The aristocratic vampire cannot, you cannot ambush with this card and uh, the hunter can become delayed to discard this card and he will also move up the track, uh, advance the influence track by four. You have cards like the saboteur, which says that you return, uh, the hunter becomes delayed, which means that he's going to lose his action. Uh, the matured effect is that you place a roadblock token on any road or railway. Desecrated Soil, draw three encounter cards and discard up the three encounter cards from your hand. Return this card face up to this hideout unless the hunter reveals Heavenly Host. If it matures, you recover three damage. Uh, unnatural Fog, you put a fog token in the city. If it is a port, place a second fog token there. Hunters cannot move into or out of a city that has a fog token. Uh, and then Bats, place a Bats token under, under the hunter. When that hunter would perform his next action... Instead, discard the bat token and move him to an adjacent city. Then the hunter becomes delayed. Now, combat. Let's talk about that. I don't want to dwell too much on it, but it is much easier than it was in the previous version. When it is time for combat to break out, meaning that either a hunter has stumbled upon a, a new vampire or uh, Dracula has stumbled onto a hunter or vice versa, then combat is going to break out. First and foremost, each hunter who is involved in the combat, which could be more than one person, is going to take a punch, an escape, and a dodge card. The punch, escape, and dodge cards are going to always be used together with any item cards that the hunter may have in hand. They have the, the same backs. Um, and they'll be, dodge says, um, just basically avoiding one of the count's types of attacks. Escape is you are removed from this combat, and punch just gets to deal one damage. Now, Dracula has his own set of cards, which he's going to draw five cards from. Oh, and by the way, I'm sorry. Dracula always has five encounter cards randomly in hand, and he will draw back up if he needs to draw another one. Uh, and with the combat cards, when combat breaks out, he'll take five of these at random. And these are things like strength. Now, notice the symbols in the top corner match the type of symbols you see on the combat cards for the hunters. That's because the hunters can cancel out Dracula's combat cards by matching symbols, by playing the right cards. Dracula Strength card says that the engaged hunter suffers two damage. If he played a punch, crucifix, or a weapon card, you cancel that card. If it is knight and he played a crucifix or a weapon card, discard that card. Uh, claws, the engaged hunter suffers two damage. Then if it is knight, choose any hunter in this combat to suffer two damage. So you see that he's stronger at knight, of course. Plotting, search your combat car deck for one card of your choice and place the chosen card in your hand and shuffle the combat deck. Keep this card face up until the end of combat. You may flip this card face down to cancel a punch, dodge, or escape. Uh, mesmerize. 
Cancel the Engage Hunter's Combat card. The Hunter is mesmerized. You suffer one fewer damage from that Hunter's weapon cards. Keep the card face up. And Fangs. You recover two damage, and the Engaged Hunter suffers two damage. If it's night, and the Engaged Hunter is mesmerized, he does not suffer his two damage, but he is bitten. He takes one of the bite markers, and you get to advance the influence track by one. There's also Escape as a Bat and Escape as Miss, which will uh, help to remove Dracula from combat. But again, he can only play these after uh, a certain amount of cards have been played based on the despair tokens on the board, because otherwise his pride will not allow him to do so. And how combat works is what I call a cosmic encounter style. Both the Count and the engaged Hunter, well, actually any Hunters that are involved in combat can play a card face down, but only, Dracula chooses one Hunter to be engaged with at a time. Let's just say for now it's one-on-one. -on -one. You have uh, the uh, Seward and Dracula are here. So Seward plays a card face down. Dracula plays a card face down. When both players have played a card, then they put them face up. So Dracula played his plotting card. But let's just say, for this instance, he instead played his claws card. Now, Seward played his dodge card, which uh, has the claw symbol on it, which means he gets to cancel out Dracula's card. Then those cards are going to stay on the board for now. And both Dracula and Seward are going to have another round of combat. Um, and this keeps going on until either one side is withdrawn from combat or six combat rounds have gone by or one of them is dead. But the point is that when you play a combat card, the previous one stays out there. You don't get that back right away. You don't get it back until uh, the, after the next round of combat, you will take those back into hand. Or I'm sorry, actually only uh, Drac or only the hunter takes this card back on the subsequent round. Dracula's cards just stay out there and play. However, Dracula gets to redraw from his deck of combat cards um, after each card that he plays. And remember that the goal for the hunters is to kill Dracula by uh, hitting him uh, with 15 points of damage. But if a hunter is by himself or herself, they may not have what it takes to stand up to Dracula toe to toe unless their friends can come to help uh, very quickly. So it's better sometimes to escape. Whereas Dracula some t doesn't want to get ganged up on and die, but he may want to corner one of the hunters in order to move up his influence track by defeating him or biting and or biting him. Now, that's the main core of the gameplay. The hunters are trying to kill Dracula. Dracula's trying to move up his influence track to 13 as fast as he possibly can and keep the game going as long as possible in order for the despair tokens to be put out on the board which is going to increase Dracula's power and uh, increase the odds of him winning the game as well. If you think that you want to try the advanced rules or you think just that Dracula is having too hard a time there's a couple of different things you can do. You can use rumor tokens and uh, the power cards the rumor tokens come out every time that you would put a despair token out onto the board, and you'll actually put those onto uh, into, onto the hideouts uh, that you've created. Oh, and he also starts the game with a rumor token as well. After you put an encounter card down, you can place a rumor token on one of the hideouts on the first three spaces of the trail. And if a vampire matures from a hideout that has a rumor token, you get to advance the influence track an additional three spaces. Now, the power cards are just this whole other set of things that Dracula can do. And put, uh, he can put these cards on the trail uh, the same way he would normally place encounter cards and location cards. And they have various different effects. Hide is the only card that lets him essentially stay in the same place. He'll put this down, face down on the trail uh, and... Uh, also place an encounter card on the card with it but uh, essentially you put this down in place of an encounter uh, uh, location card and that signifies you staying in the same place dark call you can take two damage to draw five encounter cards misdirect you can clear a hideout on any space of the trail that is not your current location and then put the misdirect card in that space then choose a location to place on the first space of the trail the wolf form when you place this card on the trail you choose a city up to two roads away Place that city's location on top of this card and then suffer a damage. And finally, feed. When you place this card on the trail, you recover three damage. Now, all those seem really powerful, but do bear in mind, because they take the place of location cards, he doesn't get them back until they fall off the trail. And that's that. I tried to keep it as brief as possible. I'm sure I didn't succeed, and I probably glossed over a few things still because it's, there's a lot of stuff going on in the game. But generally speaking, the hunters just want to kill Dracula. Dracula just wants to stay hidden as long as possible and raise up his influence track by maturing new vampires, picking away at the hunters, and just keeping the game going. That is the third edition of Fury of Dracula. Let's get to my final thoughts. 
So very rarely will I have any kind of list or script that I read off of for my videos. For the top tens and things like that, I'll do that. I'll have a cheat sheet off the side so I can keep things in order. But usually I try to do my reviews off the cuff or off the roof, as Bobo would say. That's a really inside reference, I'm sorry. Uh, but in this case, I was really, as I was playing and afterwards and as I was uh, setting up the overview of the game, I was really trying to remember all the changes that I noticed. And again, I don't think I caught them all, but let's just run through those real quick. And then for people who are new to Fury of Dracula, I'll go over my um, final thoughts on it in general. But the first thing I noticed for people who played the second edition is, well, the most noticeable thing uh, is, I think, the train tickets. That's the first thing I noticed. I'm like, oh, there's no dice anymore. I'm totally okay with this change. And I think they were taking a page from one of their other playbooks, Fantasy Flight, with Eldritch Horror, and how that one handles the uh, train and... Um, uh, an ocean tickets, and this one is just the train tickets, and it's much better. I mean, rolling, uh, I mean, it, it, I guess the, the result is the same, but it was just another slightly complicated system in the second edition of the game. Now it's just take a ticket, might have a random number on it, not a big deal, you can have two tickets, and so on. It, it really simplified that, I'm totally okay with that change, but again, it doesn't fundamentally change things. Um, then there is the whole despair. That's the other really noticeable thing, is that you have this now despair meter that fills up when you go around the track. And this is interesting because there's no longer as much of a time limit on the hunters as there was before, but there still kind of is because the longer you let Dracula go unchecked, things just get worse and worse and worse for you. Despair enhances his Fury of Dracula ability. It, uh, if you're using the rumor tokens, which rumor tokens, which you might as well, I think you should use the advanced rules in this version, um, which were inherent to the other version. Now they're optional, but I think Dracula was depowered enough in this version that, which we'll get back to in a second, that you want to use the rumor tokens and the power cards, but I digress. But when you're using those rumor tokens, it gets even more uh, inherently bad, um, I think, unless I'm getting confused but the, with the despair. But there's a lot of things in the game that are just enhanced by that despair. And it's an interesting element to the game to where, okay, maybe you can let him go around for a while, but it gets worse and worse for you. So. You want to, if as a hunter, time is still against you in a big way. Uh, the way that they broke down the day and night phases is different, and I think that's for the better because before it was kind of like a lot of things going on at once. Now, very clearly, you can do this in this phase, move to the next phase. Combat happens now. In a way, it makes things a little more tricky to explain, but I think it's better for conflicting actions and things like that. Combat, much, much better now. I I can't, I mean, combat was always an aggravating thing in the original Fury of Dracula, but it was a necessary thing, especially for the Hunters to actually have it to win, uh, obviously. Uh, but that's one of the reasons why a sat, uh, Dracula one was always satisfying, is because like, yay, we don't have to deal with combat. But now it's very simple. Um, most of the, it still feels the same, but it's like, just streamlined. So, you know, cosmic encounter style, put a card down, flip it, match symbols, boom, done. Feels fast, feels visceral, move on. Nothing is too complicated with that, and I really appreciate that aspect of it. Um, together with uh, how the items work and the event cards, it's much, much better here. Uh, I mentioned this before, Dracula's power feels less. First and foremost, the card that everybody hates, unless you are playing Dracula, and even then you feel cheesy using it, um, the instant teleport, essentially instant win card is gone. That one essentially, if in the previous edition said, hey, I play this card, now I go off to some other part of the map and you have to find me all over again. Essentially, we've reset the game, except that now you have less time. <laughs> so that, re that card really was aggravating for everyone involved and I'm glad that it's gone. And the other event cards that are in the game, I didn't go through every single old card and compare them to the new ones. They feel less powerful though. And I think that's for the best because Dracula really did have an edge in every way in the previous edition. Now, it's not that he has less than the Hunters. I feel as if it's balanced out. I only played this new edition a couple of times, but I, and so I can't really say that. I can't, I don't have statistics for 20 plays. That's my feeling and impression. And then, uh, that, that's that. Those are the major things that I noticed. Um, it, it, it feels easier for, uh, well, Dracula's threat meters is weird, obviously. Uh, it's not, it's threat or influence now. And the fact that it's now up to 13, but how you get influence, it, it happens in bigger spurts or potentially can because of the despair meter. That feels kind of six of one, half a dozen of another. But I do like the fact that with the um, encounter cards, 
uh, that is also different. I should have mentioned that. Um, without having to have the tokens. That's a physical component change that I think is for the better too. Because when you think about it now, why wasn't it cards to begin with? <laughs> it was neat that it was tokens because they fit on the cards, but it was kind of irrelevant. And because they were tokens, that you had to look at a separate sheet on the back of the rule book to figure out what they all did. Now it's just on the card. Dracula can look at them without constantly picking up the book and looking at them. And the, the hunters don't have to worry about what it could potentially be by looking at the book. Now it's just on the card, boom, done, simple. It gives you the potential to have different types of vampires, and that's a cool thing. So there's more nuance to the encounter cards, but they're also simple at the same time. And I'm sure there's some other small uh, things that I didn't mention, but overall, all of these changes mean it just made Fury of Dracula a little more practical, a little more streamlined, a little bit faster, and I like that. The rule book is much better this time. It just feels like a more streamlined game, which I know people would naturally have the tendency to complain about because they're like, oh, you're taking away the depth and complexity of the game. That's what happened with studying Emerald recently with that new edition. But no, I really feel like this is the same game a little bit better. And that's, and more importantly, widely available, and that's a fantastic thing. And if you're new to Fury of Dracula, what are my thoughts on it? It's great. It is incredibly thematic. It is a one versus all game, which is a genre that I already appreciate. A hidden role, not hidden role, but a hidden deduction game. That's another aspect of it that I like. It feels so cool with all the different special abilities and items that you have. It's of those types of games, the hidden deduction and mo hidden movement games, uh, it is one versus all. It is the most thematic that I have played. I don't even like vampires that much. I'm not into the Bram Stoker uh, books or the lore that much, but this is oozing out of every pore with that theme. That sounds gross, but I guess that's appropriate. Um, it really is. The theme is just dripping off the game, and I can't tell you how much I appreciate that in a board game. And this one just works. It's a beautiful looking game, no matter which edition you have, but this one especially so, I think. Um, and it, it just works very, very well. It is a little bit long. This one I think is shorter, but not that much shorter. And it is complex and it does take a while to explain, even if that again is better with this edition. Um, so it's not gonna be for everybody, but for people who like cooperating with other players, people who like thematic games, dark supernatural horror games, there's not a ton of those out there, at least that are very good. This is going to be right up your alley. I won't belabor the point too much. Fury of Dracula is an amazing game no matter which edition you get, of the second and third editions at least, and at least you can now get this one this time, and you certainly should give it a shot. That is Fury of Dracula, third edition from Fantasy Flight Games. Definitely give it a look. Thanks for watching. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Patreon. And make sure to check out our sponsor, Board Game Bliss, where you can find an amazing selection of games from around the world. BoardGameBliss.com. Thanks for your support.